Ray, thank you so much for joining us and being willing to be our first person today. We're so glad to have you with us, and you have so much to share with us, and we have just this one short hour time, so I know we have to start immediately, so thank you for being here. Before you talk to us about what happened to you and your family during the war and the Holocaust, start first with a little bit about your family, your community, and your life before the war began. Um, I come from a town that was just four kilometers from the Russian border. My family, my mother, unlike women at that time, was a businesswoman. She had a fabric store. She did retail, but she also did wholesale. She traveled to some of the bigger cities in Poland where they manufactured um, fabrics and brought bolts, had actually delivered bolts of fabric, and she uh, sold to stores, to smaller stores, and also to a store that was in front of our house. We had much help in the house. My father was also in business. He did some exports of all places to Germany. He exported flax, which was used to make rope. The seeds from flax are used to extract oil. He also provided meat to the army of garrison that was near my town. Since it was close to the border, there was also a military presence in the area. And that enabled him to provide meat to the Jewish community because Poland had a restriction how much uh, slaughter could be done for kosher, which is the requirement of the Jewish diet, the Orthodox Jewish diet. And so he was able to, by a little bribery, mm -hmm. uh, slaughter in the kosher way and be able to provide meat to the Jewish community and also to the military. My father did travel with his produce, the products that he delivered to Germany, but he never entered Germany. He only went as far as the border. He happened to have gotten an infection that was uncurable at the time because that was pre-penicillin, and he died in 1937. My mother took over for him. The, there were no banks, as you know now, for farmers, mm -hmm. farmer banks, <laughs> so mm -hmm. they could borrow money, so they could um, sow the next season. My father was one of the people who provided them with a loan so they could start the product, and then when, they, when the product was grown, they would repay him by, with the product. <laughs> So we were pretty comfortably off. We had help in the house. Needless to say, my parents weren't in a position to raise us all together. And they had a very good relationship with the community around. Including the, the, the non-Jewish community, right? Of course, yeah. the non-Jewish community yep. is where we, she dealt, my mother dealt with mostly, and so did my father. Right, right. Um, I was, I visited some of the, um, clients' houses, they became friends. They weren't just clients. Mm -hmm. But things changed. Be before we turn to that, let me ask you a couple other questions. Your father, as you said, died when you were young. Do you, do you remember much about him? Not very much. Mm -hmm. Not very much. I remember, I remember a very tall man. Mm -hmm. I remember him putting me on, my, on his shoulders to touch when electricity was uh, wired into our house, and the chandelier became electric to touch it, that we had cold light. Mm. I remember that particular thing. I remember a portrait hanging in the living room mm -hmm. of him, and I have a picture of that time, too, that my aunt, who emigrated to the United States, had given me. It was sent to her. And you started school very young, didn't you? I, I, read, I was able to read by the age of three. I was also trilingual. 
uh, the Yiddish language, which was spoken in the house, Hebrew, because my father had started a school mm -hmm. of, should I say, with, he, basically he financed some, mm -hmm. a, a private school that taught Hebrew and Polish. And of course the language was Polish and Belarus, which mm -hmm. are very similar to each other. I still mix them up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because I had, uh, you would call it now, a nanny or a governess, I don't know how to call it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, a woman that took care of me and she introduced me to reading and I guess I, I picked it up early. So when the school was formed and they needed students to fill the seats, my father enrolled me. So I started school at the age of at three. At the age of three. Nazi Germany attacked Poland on September 1st, 1939, starting the Second World War. That wasn't Nazi Germany. No, 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 not attacked Poland, but on September 17th, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east as, and as part of their agreement with the Nazis. So your town was occupied by the Russians. You were just seven years old. What, do you, what can you tell us about what life was like under the Soviets. You know, it's a little confusing why I'm, I'm seven okay. and I'm nine at the same time. Oh, but yes, that'll please come explain later. that, okay. That'll come later. Yeah. Uh, the, and that was, we, officially you were born in 1930, but uh, you're- Actually 1932. But your birth, your official record was 1930. 1930, yeah. it's oh, a little we, confusing. We, we should probably, let's take a moment, why was that? Uh, my mother was very resourceful and uh, the Nazis had uh, a certain age when uh, they thought that uh, children were of working age. And the age was different, but that goes, it'll come in we'll the come second in later, ghetto. Okay. So now you're, you're, you're under a Russian occupation. What was that time like for you and your family? Uh, my mother had to basically uh, closed the store. Okay. She distributed most of the fabrics to some of the clients or farmers that she knew. Uh, the Russians basically looted. Aside from that, they needed housing. So they evicted some families from large homes mm -hmm. that they wanted and we have started to share our house with another family that was evicted from their mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. So we kind of were a little more crowded than we used to be. Uh, the families, unlike here, had their children living with them and also their aging parents and sometimes aunts and uncles. I don't know how many people it was, but I can tell you that half our house was occupied by someone else. Mm -hmm. Ray, you um, shared with me that at one point your family thought that the Russians might ship you off to Siberia, um, but later, when you weren't, the family sort of wished they had been sent off. Will you say more about that? Of course. Uh, okay. The Russians had uh, labeled some people who were well off as bourgeois. Mm -hmm. Basically, they evicted them or deported them, I think would be a better way of putting it, to Siberia. Uh, they put them into harsh mm -hmm. conditions and hard labor. Uh, we were packed. I remember bundles sitting in the house ready to go because they w did not give much notice. They would give a half hour notice to collect belongings and took people away in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, there were conditions that prevailed uh, for the eviction. I guess we were on the list but didn't make it. We've, now, in hindsight, we wish we were deported. Maybe more of us would have remained right, alive. Right, right. You would live under the Soviets until June of 1941 when Germany turned on the Soviets and attacked the Soviet Union. The German army entered your town later in the summer of 1941. By the end of 1941, the Germans forced you and the other Jews in your town of Akshitsi into a ghetto. What, 
What do you recall of what, what happened, how your lives changed once the Germans came in? Uh, the, in the beginning, uh, well, once the Germans came in, from the beginning we really didn't know much. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather, who lived through the First World War, remembered the Germans as being very humane and very uh, considerate. Mm -hmm. uh, he had uh, German officers uh, in his house, and actually one of them he recognized, and that from, officer from the First recognized World War. him from the First World yeah. War. However, when my grandfather approached him, and I want to tell you that a lot of it is from my mother's remembering right, and right. talking to me about it. When my grandfather approached him, he told him, not now, later, I will see you later. Mm -hmm. He came to visit my grandfather at night and brought an orange, which was a big gift at that time because Europe didn't see oranges or bananas. <laughs> they were all imported. And told my grandfather that it's not the same German army, to please be tolerant and hopefully there will be tolerance toward you. Mm -hmm. So we were aware already that something was in the offing. Mm -hmm. However, there was not much one could do. The German armies occupied our town and within about a month, we were ordered to put on a mark on us, a yellow star, a yellow star of David, inner garments, outer garments, front on the left side, back on the right, right back side. In, and if anybody was on the sidewalk, we had to give way to them. Some of the kids that I knew that I played with started to bully me. I uh, didn't want to go out of the house. Aside from that, they would push us into the street. Uh, all the transport was by horse and buggy, mostly. So you can imagine that the horses weren't exactly sanitary. <laughs> Right. And the streets were not very clean, and being pushed into the street wasn't anything pleasant. In, in fact, you were required to walk in the streets, right? We were required, if anybody was on the sidewalk, to walk in the street, or basically in the gutter. In the gutter. Mm -hmm. your, your home happened to be in the area where the Nazis created the ghetto um, in Dachshitzi. What What changed for you and your family once once the ghetto was established? Uh, actually, the ghetto was established in November. The Nazis came in in September. In November, they have forced all the population, the Jewish population, into an area that was completely enclosed. Our house happened to be in the ghetto because the our street, which was a main street, the houses all had big gates. They were gated, mm -hmm. uh, I guess that was the style, I, mm -hmm. I have no idea. So that was a barrier on, on the main street. Then the rest of it was either boarded off or barbed wired. Uh, the synagogue area was included, which had a uh, open plaza sort mm -hmm. of area. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody was given just a half hour to pack and then they were forced into the ghetto. I remember that our house was full. I remember that at night you couldn't walk by because everybody would uh, make room for themselves on the floor to sleep on whatever bedding mm -hmm. there they was available. I remember sleeping having to give, in, give up my, my room, and sleeping on my mother's bed, must have been a double bed because we all slept uh, across the bed. Mm -hmm. And I remember that it was more people than just my mother, my brother, and I. Mm -hmm. uh, food, the Nazis needed workers and also the population took advantage of it, and many of the Jewish women became uh, workers in, as maids. 
Uh, they also had to do the laundry for the Nazis, uh, for the soldiers. I don't know if all of them were Nazis or were they just forced into the army. They were, uh, they needed laundry, they needed cooking. They also needed manpower. They needed to have their horses groomed, their boots shined, and they needed the roads worked on because the roads were primitive roads. They were not paved roads. Mm -hmm. And the Nazis did have uh, trucks and tanks. The tanks. And mm -hmm. in order to move toward the front lines, they had to have the, the right passage. And when you say the Nazis um, took people to, as workers, that was slave labor. They were not. It was slave labor. Yeah. Uh, I've recently discovered um, information from an encyclopedia that was collected with information. I'm still learning really what happened because my memory as a child, seven to nine to mm -hmm. 10 years old, I don't know how many of you remember things from that age mm -hmm. other than fleeting memories. Um, the conditions in the ghetto were not really good. The Nazis allowed for the people that went out to work to do some bartering. Those that were enslaved in outside families were given a little bit more of food. The rest was a question of what you could barter on market day when Jews were allowed to come to the, some openings, opening gates in the ghetto and barter for food. Uh, we were fortunate to a degree because some of the people that my parents knew would bring food to the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother had an arrangement that they could use whatever they were given to hide for her as payment for whatever they did for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the general public, depending on how they could manage, some of them were able to get sufficient food and some of them did not have sufficient food. Mm -hmm. Also, the Nazis required ransom. I don't know what else to call it. At first, they required money, and the way they collected, the way they put out their request for the ransom was supposedly the ghetto was going to be ruled by itself. They, they had appointed five elders as a committee with a head of the committee, one of the prominent citizens, and they would put their request to, to this, this council, committee, yeah. to this council, and the council had to collect it from the mm -hmm. citizens in the ghetto. At first, it was just money. Then it was any kind of gold objects. And they said that was all for the purpose of waging the war, to support the war, their war. Their war. Mm -hmm. Their war. How much of it went into their pockets and how much of it was mm -hmm. given to the German government is always a question. Yeah. Ray, you. Um told me that it wasn't long after the ghetto was established that the Nazis began, your word was diminishing the ghetto. What did, what did you mean by that? Uh, they were shrinking the ghetto. Shrinking the ghetto. Uh, at first, they claimed that they were resettling the Jews to bigger cities. Mm -hmm. uh, the first resettlement was rather uh, unknown to what would happen, but very quickly, we found out that they took some several hundred people to a pit and just gunned them down, shot them dead. People started to worry about it, and hiding places were established by some of the families. Since we lived in our own house, we had really a very uh, nice hiding place, or should I say compared to some of the others, because the house and the warehouse were built L-shaped, but there was a space between the walls of the house and the warehouse, but all of it was under one roof. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know who built the house, whether my grandfather, I think it must have been my grandfather mm -hmm. before my father, but 
um, that was also used as a safe to keep some things that people here would put in a safe or a safe place. And that space, from what I recall, was big enough for two people to walk by mm -hmm. because we spent some time in there. Every time there was some sort of um, rumor that something was going to happen, we had to climb into that space. We had to climb over, actually there was a, a big stone oven, we had to climb up on that and then up to the attic and then, and then down into the space, to yeah. the space. That space was stacked with some supplies. Um, the second time when the Germans had what they called a resettlement, they took quite a number of people but people were hiding as soon as word got out, right. as soon as a rumor came out or whatever, uh, people started to hide. So they went from house to house and whoever they could gather, they took people away and again to the pit and shot them. There was no way of escape because there was retribution if anybody escaped. Uh, the only way to escape was when people were taken out to work and somehow escaped from their detail, work detail. And the punishment for that was 10 for one. They would collect 10 Jews for each one that they missed from a detail and gun them down in front of the population. They also counted the people. Everybody had to be accounted for. If anybody was missing, they counted the dead, they counted the living. Mm -hmm. and, the, and if people were missing, there were reprisals for that as unless, well? Unless they had a corpse, yeah. they, there was a reprisal. Yeah. Ray, you, you weren't <coughs> in that ghetto very long before your mother began making plans to escape from there. Tell us about um, how she was able, what happened and how you were able to get out of the ghetto with you and your brother and your, your mother. Originally, what happened was is that the uh, committee had appointed what they called Jewish police with the, uh, with the excuse that they would police the ghetto. However, the Jewish police, quote unquote, <laughs> police, uh, were very watchful as to what the Nazi plans were and spread the word very quickly throughout the ghetto. Word spread that they were going to have another resettlement. Uh, needless to say, we went into hiding. However, that last resettlement, which happened at the end of May 1942, which was less than a year after the Nazis or the German armies occupied our town, was a complete annihilation of the ghetto. They opened the ghetto to looting, and of course, anybody they found, they took into a warehouse, collected them, took them to the pit, and shot them. We stayed in that hiding place. Some people that managed to get in couldn't stand the claustrophobia and went out at night and were caught. When it became impossible for us to stay there any longer because lack of food and worst of all, sanitation. When we heard it was quiet on the eighth day after mm -hmm. this, this thing began, we climbed out and my mother, my brother, I and two children behind us, my grandmother behind us, and I don't know who else was behind us, but we all of a sudden heard voices. We had another hiding place in a pantry that was just out, attached to the kitchen, and there was a root cellar there, and that was another hiding place. We very quickly went into that hiding place. My grandmother being slower behind us, was caught, but before she was caught, when she heard them approaching closer, she covered us up and she acted crazy. She said she 
didn't, didn't know where she was. She was hiding and she's all by herself and she's hungry and basically acted out of sorts and they took her away. We stayed the night in that hiding place and ventured out when it got quiet again. We got as far as the edge of the ghetto. My mother knew the area very well. She knew where, where to go. We were met by two guards. They were Polish townspeople. They had rifles and they were standing on guard because I guess their account wasn't quite complete. So they figured there are still some Jews around. Mother had some trinkets that she still had, some jewelry. And she asked them, she says, you know me, you know I was always good to you. I'll give you whatever I have, just let us go. They put the rifles on their shoulders, put out their hands, mother gave them the trinkets. And before they had a chance to put them away, we ran. Mm -hmm. We ran to a village nearby, some very good friends of ours. I remember having gone at Christmas time to their house to help decorate the Christmas tree. And I even remember the ornaments we made. I remember we took an egg, made a hole in one end, a hole in the other, blew out the egg. We had a whole shell, painted a face on it, put on a hat with a string, and hung it on the tree. <laughs> Don't remember anything else, but I remember, remember that. that. Uh, we were very close with those people. They had children our ages, my brothers and my age. And the man said that he would take my son and my brother, who was his son's age, and hide him. My mother took me to another home where she was going to leave me. However, within a short period, within a short time, in, we were in that house and they gave us some food to eat and we were eating. Word came, you know, villagers, grape wines were very good. Mm -hmm. And word came that my brother was caught and was taken away. And because the man who was hiding him would not say where he was, started to beat him. His son, who was my brother's age, a mere four going on five, couldn't stand his father being beaten so badly and told him where my brother was. The woman told my mother, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> she told my mother that a safe place for her to hide right now would be in the bathhouse. The farmers did not have bathrooms like you all have, <laughs> or the farmers nowadays have. Right. They had a bathhouse that they used to bathe on Saturday to get ready, cleaned up for church on Sunday. And so, since it was Thursday, we could hide there for a day because on Friday, somebody would start preparing the bathhouse for the influx of the people. We stayed there overnight. The woman came, brought us some more food, and told us we better leave. So we started the track, walking at night, hiding during the day in the cornfields. Corn was pretty high and we could hide, go in and hide in the rows of the cornfields. We managed to get to another village. The woman that took care of my brother was a single woman and we went to her house when she found out that my brother was taken, he, she offered to go to the town and find out what happened to him. And if she could find him, she would take him for her own. Maybe the Germans would allow her to take the child because she was childless. She came back and told my mother that my brother was shot. We even know the day. It was June the 8th of 1942. She was afraid to keep us because they would make a connection. She said it was safer for us to just go on. Again, on foot, hiding during the day, 
walking at night, we got to the home of a woman who really owed my father a big debt because she lost her husband and my father financed her until she could get herself on her feet. She had two sons and a daughter. She hid us for a couple of days, but she was afraid to keep us again because the population was very belligerent. The Nazis had offered 10 kilo sugar for exposing a Jew. Sugar was a very desired commodity. And so what was the life of a Jew? They would get 10, 10 kilo sugar. She was afraid to hide us. However, on market day, most of the farmers took their produce to a bigger city on market day to sell. That was their way of disposing of their foods and getting money to satisfy their other needs and feed and grain and seed for the next, next cycle. She dressed my mother in her clothes. She dressed me in her daughter's clothes. They happened to be close in age. Her son drove the wagon. She and her daughter hit for the day to the big city, to the marketplace. This is in Glomboka. Which is Glomboka. Yeah. We left the marketplace and with the population that went back from the ghetto after their workday, managed to get into the second ghetto. Of course, the son went back and they basically resumed their lives and we were in the ghetto so, without papers. And here you, were, yeah, here you are without papers in the ghetto of Glen Boca and your mom is very intent now of getting out of this ghetto and going to find the partisans in the forest. Tell us how she managed that. Uh, first of all, she got us documents okay. from the people in the ghetto and that's when she got me documents that I was two years older. So instead of being 10, I became 12 and I was old enough to go outside of the ghetto for work. I was sent to work in a spinning mill where threads that were broken had to be tied. That was my job. But it gave me a way out of the ghetto. My mother got a position <laughs> as a laundress. So she could also go out of the ghetto to do the, do the work, come back at night. So we had a way of going out. And mother, during market day, and with the help of this woman, contacted my father's a friend who smuggled a gun to my mother, a Luger, a German Luger. I don't know how he got it, but he smuggled it in in a basket of eggs. Straw on the bottom, the gun, straw on top, and eggs on top of that. The Nazis would not put their hand into eggs because if one was broken, they would get messed up. <laughs> Made sure there were a couple of eggs broken. One day, once mother found out exactly where the partisans were, on the way out, on the way back from work, actually, we disappeared. And with the farmers that were going back to their villages, started to walk toward the area where the partisans were. We were met on the way by a German truck, two soldiers offering us a ride. Mother was a beautiful woman, I guess she attracted attention very quickly. She was very stoic too. And you had false identification we, papers. We don't, ha we have Jewish identification okay. papers. We didn't oh, have any okay. identification papers okay. at all. Mother told them that we were going to a distant village. First of all, she asked them where they were going to. When they said where they were going to, she quickly figured out where she could get off the truck. And she told them that she lived, we lived in a distant village and they offered part of the way they didn't have time to take us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we got to a certain crossroad, mother knocked on the back of the window and told them this is where they sh we should get off. 
we got off and we got away. We managed to get as far as where the partisans were. For our audience purposes, just in case, partisans were the resistance groups that were operating yeah, they, in the forest. They were Rus well, actually, they were Russian prisoners of war that were badly mistreated by the German armies. And so they escaped en masse. Many of them were shot. First of all, they were, they were shoeless. They took their shoes and took their outer clothing. So the, yeah. the weather was pretty cold. It wasn't, we're not, I, we don't come from a warm climate. So, Ray, here's this group of partisans who obviously are fighting for their lives. Who shows up but you and your mother, your mother with a little girl? What was the reception like? Why did well, they take actually, you in? Actually, what happened was they were pretty organized by then. They organized themselves very quickly yeah. because, remember, the Nazis took over, started in right. September. By October, they had gone pretty far in, mm -hmm. and by November, which was already the winter season, they were in Russia. These prisoners of war were being taken out from that area. So without shoes and without outer clothing, they were pretty uncomfortable. And when they realized how badly they were mistreated, they started to run en masse and escape to the forest. When they got to the forest, they had to organize themselves into groups. And their aim at that point, they realized what was happening. They wanted to slow the progress of the front lines. So they became a resistance group. Uh, by the time we got there, the next summer, they were pretty well organized. And actually, some of them had managed to get across the front lines to the Russian side and had brought back uh, they were plain soldiers, but they brought back with them some officers to organize them. So what I was and we were, okay, Bill, okay. I'll interrupt you now. Okay. <laughs> uh, we were with what they called a SPES group or forward group or reconnaissance group, as you would name it. So there were just about 20 of them and they had to depend on the farmers to provide their food and laundry and so forth. So mother offered herself as the cook, and she had a helper. And she also offered them a gun, which was a very big uh, acquisition for mm -hmm. them because mm -hmm. they had very little ammunition. The only ammunition they had was from dislodging trains that were going to the front lines and whatever they could glean quickly before the soldiers came out mm -hmm. and basically they had to flee. So we were with them for a bit of time. They accepted us and the only problem was that I got typhus, I became sick. And so we had to leave our group and we had to go further into the forest where I could be taken care of, mm -hmm. and that's where we got caught. And, be, and be, before you go to that, and, and I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, at one point you were, had an incident where you were actually shot at, as I recall. Uh, that happened much later. At first, at first we were taken, we were caught, because we were not with our group, and I had already, uh, gotten better mm -hmm. from, typhus. from typhus. However, uh, my, my head was shaved. We were caught by the Nazis mm -hmm. because the front lines were progressing. Russia got help from the United States and equipment mm -hmm. and were able to resist the Nazis. They were, the German armies were not equipped for the winters in Russia. Mm -hmm. And so the Russians got the upper hand and they were pushing them back. They had the resistance, the partisans, in the back of the, of the German armies and the Russian armies in front. And so the partisans had to disperse because they were pushing mm -hmm. back. And so we were not with our unit and we got caught because the uh, Nazis had taken the farmers 
out of their villages so they could haunt the Russians. Remember the front lines were just people, soldiers right, right. all over the place. And so we wound up in our town and the rule by the Germans was not to keep the women with the men. So they started to separate the women from the men. The women they would send back to the villages, the men they would take away to harsh labor. I was dressed like a boy, had no hair on my head, had girls' features, and they decided that I would go to the, to the men line. Needless to say, I was a child. What do you expect from a 10, 11 year old? I knew when they started to argue whether I was a girl or a boy, and the Yiddish is very similar to the German, and I picked up some of the German language. <coughs> I said Mechen, so they would send me to the woman's side. They decided I must be Jewish. The penalty for being Jewish was to go to the gallows. They had hanging scaffolds, scaffolds yeah. with noose hanging down, several rope noose. They put me under it. My mother got word of it. She ran out very quickly and started to argue with them that I'm not Jewish, I'm her daughter, to hang her first because she did not want to see her child being hung. She offered herself to be hanged before me. And I guess some of them were a little soft, softer hearted. They were not the Gestapo, they were not the SS, they were just plain soldiers and they let me go. So both of us went back with the people to the villages. However, we went from village to village. We had no home, we had no place to go really. We had no, no papers, nothing. So we went from village to village, supposedly to our own village. However, somebody recognized my mother and she confided in somebody else that she thinks she knows who my mother is and she is Jewish. However, the other woman was very soft-hearted. She had recognized my mother, she told her before, but she kept quiet. Mm -hmm. She told my mother to disappear. We very quickly left the village and went into the forests. Uh, the forests around our area are all pine forests, so it's easy to hide under a pine tree, especially if you have a couple of branches high, uh, covering you. And well, we managed to get to the partisans. And I'm looking at the time. <laughs> we managed to get together with some of the group. I'll kind of and progress to, to, a little faster. To liberation, yeah. To liberation. Yeah. We managed to find some of the partisan groups, joined with them, and were liberated very shortly thereafter. Mother, having been with the partisans, was given an opportunity to enlist to fight the Nazis. So she became a worker on a train, on a, a train that went from station to station to fix the water towers because the trains were run on steam. And she had, in a way, managed to get, we've lived in a boxcar, we had just a pallet in a boxcar with other workers. When we got to Prussia, we were very close to the front lines and her aim was to get over to the Allied side. She found out where there were some Jews in southern Poland that were liberated from camps and had our boxcar connected to one of those trains. We got to the city of Lublin. From there, there, was, there were guides that helped Jews going toward, basically at that time, the only place that Jews could go to was Palestine, which is now Israel. And a little bit by train, a little bit by foot, a little bit by truck, we got to Italy. We actually crossed the Alp, an Alpine pass on foot, on foot to get yeah. into Italy. 
try to make it short. Yeah, it is. So, and once you made it, once you made it um, uh, to Santa Cesarea, the hope had been, your mother had hoped that you would go to Israel or to Palestine. What, why, why did you, why were you not able to go? Because the ships were intercepted. Mm -hmm. And actually, the one that we were supposed to go on ended up in Cyprus. Our mother got sick. She, she got asthma and had to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And so we, we missed that ship. However, after that, it became very difficult to, to go to Israel because of the ships being intercepted. And mother started to uh, write, actually she started to write before that, mm -hmm. to my father's sister, my aunt, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But she forgot the D.C. and she sent the letters to Washington. They came back undeliverable. She advertised in the Jewish newspaper, trying to look, she knew that my aunt was married, she knew her married name, that she's looking for William, and she didn't know that my aunt had changed her name to Shirley from Chashka, <laughs> for William Achashka Gatkin. My uncle read that particular Jewish publication, saw that we were looking for, for them, and wrote to us to please stay put. He made application for us to emigrate to the United States. However, the Polish quota was very full. Mother, on the other hand, knew that the Russian quota was not full. Nobody from Russia emigrated to the United States. The communist Russia did not allow anybody. Right. And actually, when she was born in 1906, it was Russia, there was no Poland. Poland did not come into being until after mm -hmm. the Second World War. After I'm the sorry, first the one, First yeah. World War. And so she went to the consulate in Naples and convinced him that she was really born in, under the Russias. And we got a Russian visa, we came here on a Russian visa. In, in the little time we have left, Ray, just a couple other questions. So you arrive in the United States, you were 15, although your papers said you were seven, 17. 17. What, was, what was it like for you to, when you got here? Uh, what was it like for me? It was heaven on earth. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you could go wherever you want to. It's actually, Italy, Italy was very good to us. I can't say that it mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, it's too long to, to go into right. details, but um, I befriended uh, an Italian family that even took me to the opera. And they took me to Samson and Delilah, a story that I was very familiar with. And all I can say is I became a fan of opera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but aside from that, the Italians were very, very accommodating. Uh, when I came to the United States, my uncle had a grocery store. And on, it was right before Thanksgiving. And um, my cousins, he had three daughters, one of them my age, and they would go down to help in the store. Needless to say, so did I. Mm -hmm. I learned my first English words, really, were peas and carrots and all kinds of canned foods. Mm -hmm. Bread, of course, and milk. Mm -hmm. And little by little, because I found a connection between English and German and Italian, I was able to figure out a lot of words. But aside from that, my uncle sent me to a private uh, Jewish school where I could communicate with some of the students. And I learned English. I picked up English enough that in February, when the new semester started in middle school, I was able to be accepted to middle school. Uh, my, my birth certificate became a picture that my aunt had of me when I was six months old with a date in the back. That was my birth certificate. Birth. Because otherwise I would have been almost too old to go to school. Yeah. Two, two last questions for you. I believe your mother passed away in 2006. Yes. She was clearly an extraordinary woman, a very brave, uh, just an amazing woman. 
How, how was the rest of her life? Unfortunately, her rest of her life, she, the reason I know so much about my history is because my mother talked about it. Mm -hmm. After she passed away, I found a lot of letters that she wrote to the Red Cross and to wherever she thought mm -hmm. to, to inquire to see if anybody from the family was alive. She was one of six. All of them had families. All her sisters and brothers had families. Nobody survived. The whole city that had about 3,000 inhabitants Right now, I'm the only survivor. Mm -hmm. But originally, there were just about 20-some people that survived, some of them in hiding, some of them in Russia. Mm -hmm. And that was going to be my other question. When, when did you finally really learn the extent of the, the full loss of your family? The full loss of the family, actually, we learned as soon as we came out as soon as we were liberated. Mm -hmm. My mother went to our hometown. First of all, where do you go to see if anybody else survived? You go to the place where everybody was. Uh, needless to say, there was nobody there. A neighbor across the street, the picture that you saw of my mother, my brother, and I is the only possession I have from everything we ever owned. This woman who was obviously a friend. She told my mother that she picked up the picture from the trash so she would have a memento of my mother. She told my mother that if she offers her lodging for the night, that neither of them might survive to, be, to live to the next day because the town was so belligerent still. Ray, um, I'm going to turn back to Ray in just a moment to close our program. And I think it's evident to everybody in here that Ray was only able to touch just on a little bit of what she could have shared. We could spend the entire afternoon and still could not do justice to all that Ray has been through in her life. But we thank you so much for this, Ray. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for being here. Remind you that we'll have first-person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until August 8th. Our programs through June 6th will be live streamed and all of our programs will be available on the museum's YouTube page as well. Um, we didn't have time for you to ask questions of Ray, but when Ray is finished, Ray will remain on the stage and we invite any of you who would like to come up afterwards and ask Ray a question, you know, shake her hand, give her a hug, take a photograph with her. Um, May I have the last word? You're about to get it. <laughs> so with that, it's our tradition that first person, our first person has the last word. So I see a lot of young people here. I have a special message for the young people. Value your families above everything else. I have none. I have been fortunate enough to marry someone who had a big family here in the United States. I have some cousins sitting here. Mm -hmm. I really felt like I joined with my husband, I joined with his family, they all became my family. Value your family. You may be mad at your mother, and you may be mad at your father, but believe me, they are the ones that are looking out for you. And remember one thing, don't collaborate on things that you think are wrong just because it may be popular. Don't bully anybody. Just think of how you would feel to be bullied. And above all, value this, this country, the United States. It's the best country in the world right now. Thank you.